All right, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. All right, um, let's start with any questions. Is the final cumulative? Sure, absolutely. But I mean, it, it kind of has to be because you know, everything we've been doing is, has been cumulative, right? Um, so yeah, I would say it's cumulative. Yeah, someone says I feel like programming in general is cumulative. That's that's probably a good way to think of it. Um, that's going to be more so in in two twenty two because you know everything that we learn will be will be built on in subsequent uh, topics. But you know you've got to know how to do basic bash programming to be able to write a bash program that uses associative arrays, for example. So you know midterm we were looking for basic bash syntax. Um, final will be writing bash programs that use associative arrays or things like that. Um, but you can't forget, you know, how to write a loop or an if statement or things like that. Um, so I just got official word yesterday that um, that spring quarter is also going to be online or for us remote. Um, so it looks like the entire sequence is going to be done in this format, um, which I'll continue to do, you know, as a remote class instead of an online class. Online meaning, you know, you watch the lectures, you read the material whenever you like, you take your tests whenever you like, things like that. Um, this will continue to be a remote class, so we'll have regular meeting times and, you know, regular exam times and things like that. So, um, you know, we knew that was going to be the case for winter. It looks like that's going to be the case for, um, for spring as well. Um, hey, you know, but if, if people get to walk this year for graduation, I'll see anybody who goes to graduation which would be cool because um, graduation is pretty fun. It's a nice uh, point of closure. But yeah, um, otherwise, you know, I have no idea like who I'm actually talking to every day. <laughs> and this could just be a computer generated avatar that, that you're talking to, so. Zoom bots, totally. Yeah. Or, you know, figment of my imagination. But I just think I'm a teacher. All right. 
Um, so, so let me make a few comments on something that will be coming up in winter, um, which is which is the service learning project. Um, and you know, normally this is part of the fall uh, quarter, and we decided not to do that this year um, because things were were still kind of new online. But um, but we're definitely going to go back to the SLP in winter and spring. So let me let me give you a little bit of a heads up on what the SLP is about because I would like you to be thinking about it between now and the start of winter, so that when we get to winter term, you can you can write up a first proposal um, pretty soon after the quarter starts. Um, so um, service learning project SLP. The goal of this is is basically to um, give you an opportunity slash excuse to dig further into some area of computer science, engineering, something related to this curriculum, um, but to go beyond what we do in the coursework, right? So it's an opportunity for you to um, dig deeper into whatever it is that you might be interested in, um, but you're not going to you know necessarily learn about in classes here. So for a lot of people, this, this comes in the form of games, right? People are interested in learning how to um, write a game in Unity, right? Or, or do 3D modeling, um, things like that. Or, you know, you may be interested in learning more about um, building your own microprocessor-based system. Or you want to build a smart mirror that, that shows you, you know, weather and headlines in the morning. Or you want to dig into Alexa and um, you know do some some automation in your apartment. Um, whatever whatever your interest may be, there's a good chance it can be turned into a service learning project. Um, and the way this project works is basically you make a proposal, right? It's a written document which you submit to me. I review it. Typically, we talk about it. We work out some details and so on. And we might go through a few iterations of this, and then at the end, you've got you know a solid proposal with um, specific deliverables and specific milestones. So you know by um, by February third, I would like to have you know a prototype game working that basically lets you you know move around in a 3D environment and jump, right? And then by by February seventeenth, I would like to have you know three layers of the game working, plus you know one type of enemy, and and so you you spec out a plan for yourself um, with specific dates, and then you basically work on it, and it's intended to take you all the way through the end of spring quarter. So typically June um, would be the completion date. And the trickiest part of this project really is choosing a good project because it's something you should spend a lot of time on, a lot of creative energy on. So once you, you want it to be something that's meaningful to you, right? Which is why we don't assign SLPs um, and say, you know, work on this, work on that. Um, if you can pick something that you're actually really interested in, that would be the ideal. Um, and there's, there's virtually no bounds on what that could be. Provided that you know it's something that you might feel passionate about, and it's something that um, that will take you beyond what you already know how to do, right? So, if you've already you know written five games in Android, don't make an SLP saying I want to make an Android game, right? Um, and yeah, if you're worried about finishing too fast, okay, that's a good observation to make. Um, set the bar higher, right? Or, you know, find a different area that you're still interested in, but you don't know enough about to, to feel like you're going to knock it out in a few weeks. Um, and honestly, when I was in school, when I was an undergrad, um, I went to classes, I got my grades, I paid attention, I did homework. I didn't really learn a whole lot in my classes. Right. I mean, I did, but I didn't learn a whole lot in my classes that I that I actually used. Most of my learning took place outside of class, and it was mostly working on projects. And my friends and I would would you know hang out in the labs all day, and we'd just be working on projects. And somebody would get something, and we'd look at it and be like, "Well, that's really cool." And then you'd like try to improve it, you know, or try to break it, or try to come up with something derived from that. 
Um, and it was, you know, constant good spirited competition and, um, you know, teamwork from time to time, but it was, it was self-directed because the stuff that you want to learn and understand, you're going to work on that, right? You're going to spend as much time and as much energy as it takes to get it done. Um, and what, what comes out of the other side is going to be, you know, so much more than just the thing that you're working on. Um, there's a lot of, of other learning that takes place along the way. It's really the best way, in my opinion, to learn, right? People talk about project-based learning. Well, that's really all we're talking about. Um, but doing this in the context of some fairly sizable project. So we'll be starting this in, in winter instead of fall. Usually, students spend most of fall just figuring out what they want to work on. Um, we can't spend most of winter figuring out what you want to work on because then you've only got spring left to do it. So I'm going to ask you to spend, you know, the time between now and the start of winter quarter thinking about this, okay? Ask questions, send me ideas, an email. We can bounce back and forth and, and work out details. Um, and then, um, very beginning of winter quarter, We'll talk about this again, but you'll probably have about a week to turn in a proposal, right? So um, it's better if you have, you know, a month and a half to think about this than a week. So that's that's just kind of out there to uh, to start thinking about if you haven't already got, you know, five things in mind that you want to do. All right, does that make sense? All right, so let's um, let's talk about awk, and I've mentioned awk, but we haven't really dug into it yet. Um, let me pull up some stuff. Awk is one of those things, like said, that um, if you don't know about it you can get by just fine, right? And for a long time, when I needed to do something to break a file up, I would just throw together a little C program, and I would do an fgets and some scanfs and, and make it work. Um, I wasn't suffering knowingly by not being able to use awk, but once I learned awk and actually started working with it, it became indispensable. And it's, it's something that, you know, at some periods of my life, I'll use it on a daily basis for different things. Um, it's, it's that useful. So, um, so let's go through some of the basics. The Enlightenment of Awk, absolutely. So, so said was basically about, um, you know, reading a file line by line, and on each line, you know, doing some kind of, of manipulation, searching for patterns, maybe replacing some pattern with some other pattern, and so on and so forth. Um, and then maybe, you know, skipping blocks of lines, or deleting lines, or changing things on lines, and so on and so forth. Awk is, is really built around the idea of, of doing processing on an individual line where we think of our line as broken up into fields. And, you know, most things in, in Bash, fields are just things separated by spaces. So when we did our, our for loop to read phrases out of our space-separated uh, line of phrases in Homework 8, right, we said for you know, phrase in variable name, um, it was pulling out things separated by spaces. All right, and we can change what the delimiter is, but default awk, right, thinks of, of space separated entries. Um, and like most things in Unix, we can run this interactively or we can run it to process a file. So let's, let's just look at some really basic awk, right, and if this is all you learn about awk, it's still really useful. Um, so, um, before we jump into code, general structure of um, the awk command. 
So it's basically, like said, awk program and then an input file. Or if you don't specify an input file, it just reads from standard in, which means from your keyboard, or you can redirect from a file, or you can pipe the output of, of a previous command into awk. Um, and if your program is, is a single line, you can just list it right here as a string. If it's multiple lines, um, you can do dash f program file. All right, so parallel structure to said. Um, yeah, it is similar, super similar to said. Um, but the programs are different, all right? So um, what does an awk program look like? Um, basically, it's a pattern. And then curly brackets and some set of actions that you want to take. All right, it's a pattern which has to be satisfied as true, and if it is, then these actions are taken on the line. All right, so um, so if we don't specify a pattern, then our program will will run on every line of input, and the simplest action of all is just print. So, um, so here's, here's a really simple awk program. There's no pattern specified, and it just says print hello. And whatever I type in, it prints hello. Okay, that's a silly thing to do, but but that's that's what it does. And if I take this and I redirect it from, you know, my bash RC file, it prints hello for every line that it reads from that input file. All right. Well, that's not terribly exciting, but um, but that's you know our hello world, um, or hello world plus plus for awk. Um, so there's variables associated with um, with our program, and these variables are automatically set up for each line that awk reads from the file. And the first set of variables are dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, etc. And those refer to the first, second, third fields that it reads from the file. So same as the command line arguments in bash. All right. Um, there's also a dollar sign zero, which is all fields. So I can make a slightly more interesting program. print dollar sign one comma dollar sign two. So if I type in this is a test, it prints out this is. If I type in can you hear me, it prints out can you. If I print out dollar sign two dollar sign one, it does exactly what you would expect. It prints out the second field followed by the first. And it tends not to freak out. So if there's, you know, a first field, hello, and there's not a second field, it doesn't print anything for that dollar sign too. And if there's no input at all, it just, you know, prints out an empty line. And awk, you know, like bash, is very forgiving about uh, variables. Um, if a variable doesn't exist, it will you know, create it on the fly if needed and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. 
Because, you know, some, like, C freaks out all the time. Um, not as bad as Java. Java, wow, like, freaks out all the time. Worst is IntelliJ, in my opinion. IntelliJ, like, needs a vacation because, you know, you start typing something and, like, 80 things in your file turn bright yellow and squiggly lines saying, oh my gosh, there's a syntax error, you know, while well, I only type the first character of my, my keyword, you know. Um, don't be scared about Java. Java is your friend. Um, Java is, is so much fun. Um, and yeah, then you can make Minecraft plugins. Um, we, we do C because C is, you know, gets you down to the metal of, of what's going on. But um, in spring, when we switch to Java, you will never want to do C again. Um, it is it is so much more comfortable and powerful, and um, you know we can make a, a GUI that pops up and you know or a tic tac toe game or something like that with like ten lines of code or something. It's it's crazy fun, um, and then you can write Android apps and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, um, but you'll secretly like C, you just won't tell your friends. You'll be like, oh yeah, C's like terrible, you know, but you'll go home and code C when no one's looking. Um, all right, so, um, so we've got, we've got these, these fixed variables, right, that correspond to fields of the input. Um, we've, we've got some other, uh, variables like NR, which is the number of records, NF, which is the number of fields, and those those are the main two. But there's a bunch of, of other variables we can pull out the file name, and so on and so forth. Um, oh, cool! Someone made a local store finder using Google Maps API. That's awesome. Very cool. So if I print out NR, that's the number of records, the number of lines that have been read from the file. So, you know, each time I type something in, it's printing out the next uh, consecutive integer. And if I print out dollar sign zero, that prints out my entire input line. So if I were to print dollar sign, if I were to print NR comma dollar sign zero, Right. Now it's printing out my input line with a number in the front showing me what the record number is. So if I take this and I redirect it from bash RC, right, I've got a copy of my, my bash initialization script with uh, line numbers in the front. All right. There's lots of ways you can do that, but you know, this is a, a pretty quick and dirty way to do it as well. All right, um, awk also understands associative arrays. And this, this is part of why awk is so much fun. Um, and associative arrays work just like plain old arrays. We don't have all kinds of weird syntax to deal with. Basically all our arrays are associative, so we can just say um, something like, you know, array bracket key equals value and that'll just automatically you know create an associative array on the fly if we've never used this before and it'll store that value in the element you know indexed by that key so it makes the key pair association that we've been talking about all right we can do conditional statements it wouldn't be much of a programming language without that so we can say you know if something equals something, for example, um, and we can do some stuff else. We can do some other stuff. We can do while condition, 
and so on. So awk actually looks and feels a lot like C, right? But with more more forgiving syntax. Um, and so we can we can pull stuff in from a file. We can quickly break it up into fields. We can know some information, like you know how many fields are on the record, how many records we've read so far. Um, but we can also, you know, do C-like processing. Um, it also understands regular expressions. We're going to go back and, and review regular expressions tomorrow. Um, but we can, we can do things like, um, you know, variable, which could be, you know, dollar sign two or something, uh, tilde slash, and we can put a regex in here. And we can see if this regular expression matches the contents of that variable. All right. We also have some patterns that are special. There's a pattern called begin, which matches when we start processing a file. And it actually matches before the first line of the file has been read. And then we have a pattern end, which matches after the last record has been read. And so we can use these to do some initialization and do some deinitialization, some wrap up. So let me let me hop into a directory where I have some some sample code to play around with. Um, what else do I want to tell you about the structure before we jump into some code? It's probably enough. Let's go ahead and jump into some code. Um, All right, so I'm, I'm going to play with our, our foods database again, All right? So I've got, uh, you know, type of food, uh, or name of a food, type, color, and price. Um, so here's, here's an awk program, F1. Um, I have a pattern begin, and begin will, um, you know, match before we process any records. And then it will do everything that's inside these curly brackets. So first it will print out a header, and then it will print out, you know, some dashes to make a separator. And then the main body of the program will do what we did a moment ago, print the number of the record, a space, and then um, the entire record. And then at the end, after it's processed the last record, I'll just print out a summary which says total number of records and show the value of NR. So I can do off dash ff1 less than foods, and we get you know this nice little uh, itemized list of what's in that file. All right. So another thing we can do for a pattern is we can use the variable length, the uh, function length. Length will tell us the you know length and number of characters of a field. So here we can say if if the first field has a length less than or equal to five, print out the entire field, entire record. So you know anything that has has a short name apples, Oreos, kiwi, water should get printed out. Banana, hot dog, burger, shortbread those should get omitted. Right, so that prints out the, the foods with names less than or equal to five characters in length. And there's lots of ways we can we can format this. So if I print out something um, separated by commas, it puts space in between. If I if I don't specify commas, things get shoved right next to one another. 
So F3 should print out the number of the record or colon followed by the input line. So I can say this is a test. Hello, cool. Here's an empty line. All right. So so you've got you've got basic control. And I'm control Ding to end these these interactive commands, control D signals end the file, which which I think we know. All right. So there's another thing we can we can do, and this is this is a little strange to describe, but um, we can specify a pattern with a pair of conditions with a comma in between. And and the most common use for this is is oops is something like this. So start when the number uh, record number is three and stop when the numbered record is record number is six, right? And this will print out records three through six. Um, but it's, it's actually a more general syntax. This can be any condition, this can be any condition. And the way this works is, um, you know, it reads records from the input. When it reads a record where this condition is true, it describes, it sees that as matching the pattern. And it will start executing, you know, whatever the program is from that record on up to and including the point where this end pattern matches. And when the end pattern matches, it will stop. But it will continue reading the file, and if it reads another record where the start pattern matches, then it begins executing the program again. And then if it reads a record where the end pattern matches, it processes that program and it stops. So it, it alternates, right? But the most, the most typical use for it is just something like this, which is going to, you know, match this condition exactly once and match that condition exactly once. And so this will, you know, print out records three through six. Right, so that's that's a way to subset. Now there's there's other ways I could do this, right? I I could print out the first six uh, records by using head, and then I could print out the last four by using tail, right? Um, right, and I could pipe that into off. Right. Well, except I started numbering from one, so I'd have to add a thing to that. There we go. All right. So there's always lots of ways to do stuff, um, but but you know, this is arguably simpler than this. All right, and more flexible. All right, um, so we can do if statements, right? So, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm saying, um, let's look at field four, right? And field four is either cheap or expensive. Let's look at field four and see if it matches the pattern cheap. I could have just done a double equal, but we're using a regular expression, right? And if it's if it matches that pattern, then what do I do? I change field four to this other string, which says under two bucks. Otherwise, I change field four to over two bucks, and then I go ahead and I print out the entire record. All right. So there's no pattern being specified here. This is all you know inside the curly brackets. So this is the stuff that fires on every line of input. But inside that input line, I've, I've got an if statement executing.
All right, so it just changes that field in place. All right, well here we can we can um, add some local variables. So in my begin block, before I do anything, I'm making a pair of variables called cheap and expensive, and I'm initializing them both to zero. And now I'm checking field four, and if it matches cheap, I increment this variable cheap. If it matches, um, let's say expensive. If it matches expensive, then I increment expensive. So this will be doing a running tally of how many times those things occur in field four. And then at the end, after the last process is field, I'll just print those out using print statements, which look a lot like C printfs. All right, so 11 cheap, six expensive, which is good because I got 17 foods in my list. So doing this in C would take a bit of doing, right? You'd need to to you know do an F gets. You'd need to do some kind of of you know breaking up into fields. So maybe an S scan F, or maybe you can just go through and and look for spaces. Um, and then you need to do a string compare. And if we're actually using a regular expression here. Instead of just looking for that exact word, we have to use some kind of regular expression magic, right? Um, and then bump these up, and then at the end of the file, go ahead and print these things out. All right, well, we can take the same idea and use associative arrays. So let's track how many types of food we have. Right, so we have, you know, fruits, cookies, drinks, meats, unknowns, um, and vegetables and grains, right? And, and we want to catalog those. So we can use an associative array. And my program is, you know, one line. Foods bracket dollar sign two plus plus. All right. So what is this statement doing? Dollar sign two is the type of food: fruit, cookie, drink. Foods is the apparent name of an array, and I'm indexing it with that type of food. And I'm saying, you know, take food bracket drink and increment it. And just like in Bash with associative arrays, if if there is nothing in this array with this index, it's treated as having a value of zero. So the first time that I encounter, you know, a fruit, this will say foods bracket fruit plus plus. Well, it'll read the value of foods bracket fruit. It'll treat that as a zero because there's nothing in the array with that key, it'll increment it, and so now it'll be a one. And same thing when I encounter the second line, fruit, it'll say foods bracket fruit plus plus, well foods bracket fruit will be one, so it'll increment it to two. So this one line is your homework eight, basically. Right, it will go through and it will, it will tally up how many times each uh, second word appears. And at the end, we have a for loop, just like the end of, of your program A, which says for food type in foods. So this iterates across all of the elements of foods, all of the, the keys in there. And for each food type that it finds, it prints out, you know, number of that food type is, and it'll print out the value of foods with that index. Right, so there's our tally of types of food. Yeah, 100% homework eight, yay.
Did I really have two unknown foods? Oh yeah, spam and hot dogs. Um, all right. So um, so here's here's a more elaborate version of this. Um, so again, it's it's a one-line program. Right from here to here. And for each line that it reads, it's going to do the following. It's going to do a for loop. For item equals one, item is less than or equal to the number of fields on that record, item plus plus. So this is for each field on the record, and it's going to increment counts bracket dollar sign item. This is a word index, right? It tells me how many times each word of my file appears. And then again, at the end, I just say, you know, four words, word in counts, and I just print out the word and the number of times it appears. So if I run this on foods, right, that's not too interesting, but let's run it on, um, on my bash RC. Um, and there's a number of of times that different things appear. And so my most popular word in my my bash RC is the comment character followed by alias, followed by some common English and so on and so forth. So this is pretty powerful, right? Um, so awk is under slash user slash bin slash awk. So here's here's a script called index. But notice what my shebang is. Instead of saying slash bin slash bash, my shebang is user bin awk dash f. Okay, what does this first line say? It says that if somebody types in the name of this file, this is what you should run and feed the contents of that file to. Normally it's bash because we're writing bash scripts. But in this case, if I just say index, it will run awk and it will feed it all of this stuff, which is, you know, my bash program. And so if I say index, um, you know, tilde slash bash rc, it runs awk and feeds it the program contained in that index and, you know, gives me my output. So I've got, you know, a nice little built-in command now. I don't have to say awk-f blah blah blah, right? It's uh, it's wired up in this first line. So the shebang isn't always a slash bin slash bash. It can be, you know, anything that we want to execute um, to process the contents of a file. All right, here's a cool little awk program. It has a single pattern begin, after which it executes the following statements for x equals zero, x less than ten, x plus plus, print out, percent d backslash nx. If I run this, it prints out the numbers zero through nine. There's no input file being processed, there's no fields being looked at. This is basically an interpreted version of C, right? I'm just I'm just writing a little C-like program inside here and saying do this in the beginning of of your awk processing. Here's a slightly more interesting program. Set sum equal to zero for x goes from zero to less than or equal to ten. Add x to this running sum, and then when we're done, print out the running sum. So there's an off program that you know adds the integers from zero through ten. 
And there's my sum, 55. And then my own hello world for programming languages is always prime number generation. So um, so here's an awk program that prints out primes from 3 to 1001. So, um, you know, an outer loop that runs through odd numbers. And for each one, um, have a composite flag loop through from three until um, you've got a number that's bigger than the square root of the number we're checking. Count by twos, because we only have to check odd uh, divisors. And if your number divided by uh, the divisor is an integer, then set the composite flag. And then at the end of the loop, if the composite flag is zero, print out the number because it's prime. And then print a new line at the end. Right? It's an awk program. But it's it, you know, feels a lot like a C program, perhaps. So we can do a lot of things with awk. Um, so, um, I have this, um, you know, this research project going with this virtual ecosystem, and this is the program that ran for like six weeks. And while it's running, it's writing out all of this data, which is, you know, the life and, and history of each organism um, as it's playing out. And it's it's a huge file. Um, it's um, It's however big that is. I think it's four gigabytes, um, and it's it's just a bunch of space separated data, right? Um, a tag and and a cycle number. This is so far my magnum opus. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's a, a step number and an organism ID and where they are in the matrix and what's around them, and a bunch of binary flags about are they moving? Are they eating? Are they attacking? Are they being attacked? Are they mating? Are they being mated with? And so on and so forth. And, and you know, I've, I've got um, all of this data, word count can't even like finish in a reasonable time, um, to process and, and try to figure out what's going on with this because this is this weird ecosystem where I injected free will into 10% of the population and they became like, you know, 80% of the population. They somehow out-survived the, um, the programmatically described organisms. Um, and, and I don't know what's going on with that yet, but, you know, I can write, um, awk scripts that will, that will help me figure that out. So, um, you know, this is, this is good old arc, awk, um, and this one is, is trying to track, you know, how much these organisms move. So, um, date of birth is an associative array, and when I get a creature ID, if there is nothing in that array under that ID, I know this is the first time I've seen the creature, so I can set that element of the date of birth array equal to the current step number. And now I've recorded the date when this, the moment in time when this creature first appeared, and I can initialize its number of moves to zero, and so on. And then, you know, I can check these Boolean flags from different fields on the record. So moved is the 15th record. And if it moved, then I'll bump up the number of moves. If it hit a wall, I'll bump up the number of times it hit the wall. Um, and if it died, then I'll um, record its age, which is the current step number minus when it was born and so on. So you can do all this, all this post-processing. Um, and then, and then run it through, um, things like this, and if you have to go, feel free, because this takes like a minute to run. Um, but um, the other thing, we should probably talk about this at some point. Um, the other thing is GNU plot. And if you want to do some quick plotting of data, GNU plot is really good. Um, 
it does two-dimensional graphs, three-dimensional graphs, and you basically just feed it a flat file of, of numeric data, and it will, you know, make nice-looking graphs for you. Um, and that's running on the back end of, of all of this stuff. Maybe I'll put GNU Plot on my list of things to talk about. Um, we've only got two days left. Um, anyway, so, so awk is a useful tool. Um, definitely recommend uh, playing around with it a bit. I'll ask you some questions about it on the final probably, but nothing too intense. Yeah, so there's a nice little graph coming out, right? Um, and what I can tell is that the free will organisms tend to um, move around a lot more than the non-free will organisms. So maybe they're being more successful at, at hunting and gathering because uh, they're more active. Um, but I don't know why free will would make them more active. That's another open question. Anyway, um, there you go. So that's all in, uh, in one lecture. Um, have a good one. I will see you next time.